a new Eocene whale. First, um, a little background so that um, the new findings uh, make a little more sense. Um, the problem is very simple. If Darwinism is correct, whales have to have descended from other mammals. But whales are markedly different from most other mammals. And um, there are two questions that uh, need to be answered. Well, number one, um, how could this happen? And more specifically, how could this happen without some kind of guidance? Uh, and number two is, is there any evidence for it happening? And there's a related question. Well, if whales came from some other group of animals, what group of animals did whales descend from? Pardon the uh, preposition at the end. Darwin recognized the problem way back in The Origin of Species. If you look in the first edition, and I'm taking this from the annotated uh, origin by uh, James T. Costa. But uh, in, on page 183, he says, I will now give two or three instances of diversified and of changed habits in the individuals of the same species. And then he goes on to give an example of uh, uh, British insects which now eat other things besides what they used to eat, exotic plants or exclusively on artificial substances. Um, and then he talks about the tyrant flycatcher of South America and the larger titmouse and various strange habits that it has. And then he talks about in North America, the black bear was seen by Hearn swimming for hours with widely open mouths, thus catching, like a whale, insects in the water. Even in so extreme a case as this, if the supply of insects were constant, and if better adapted competitors did not already exist in the country, I can see no difficulty in a race of bears being rendered by natural selection more and more aquatic in their structure and habits with larger and larger mouths till the creature was produced as monstrous as a whale. And then he goes on to another subject. Or... Uh, the explorer, Samuel Hearn, and this is from Costa's notes, compared swimming black bears to whales when he encountered them in lakes uh, north of Churchill, Canada. Uh, and this is quoting from Hearn. This was in the month of June, long before any fruit was ripe, for the want of which the bears, I assume that was originally they, fed entirely on water insects, which in some of the lakes we crossed that day were in astonishing multitudes. The method by which the bears catch the, those insects is by swimming with their mouths open in the same manner as whales do. That's the reference to Hearn. And the bear and whale comparison became a sore point when Darwin told Richard Owen that he dropped the example for the next origin edition. Owen replied, oh, have you? Well, I was more struck with that, with this, than any other passage. You little know of the remarkable and essential relationship between bears and whales. Now, Owen was um, uh, stretching the truth a little bit there. Um, uh, certainly, um, he was more struck with this than with any other passage. Uh, but Darwin swallowed that line and restored the passage far from believing in any such relationship, however. Owen scathingly wrote in his review of the origin, we look in vain for any instance of hypothetical transmutation in Lamarck, so gross as the one above cited. And um, in the remaining editions of The Origin, Darwin simply inserted a qualifier, catching almost like a whale insects in the water. That's my emphasis. Um, so, you know, he kind of got embarrassed, but he was now too, he had in two editions and he couldn't really back completely out of it so he left it there with that little qualifier. Now of course creations have been using the question and uh, Duane Gish in 1980 is an, exception, uh, is an example of that and the reference is there in ICR. There's no fossil evidence. Or these are his main points. The transitional forms are difficult to visualize. 
And the evolutionists are unsure of which group was ancestral to whales. Basically, all of those points that I made in, at first. And um, uh, Gish goes on to say, the marine mammals thus abruptly appear, appear in the fossil record as whales, dolphins, sea cows, etc. For example, in one of Romer's concluding statements in his discussion of the subungulates, that's conies, elephants, and sea cows, he says, conies proboscoideans, uh, that's elephants, and sirenians, that's sea cows, were all already distant groups at the time when they first appear in the fossil record. In other words, there's no evidence of them coming from an original uh, creature that had the possibility to go all three ways. Olson states that if we seek the ancestors of the marine mammals, we run into a blank wall as far as intermediate stages between land and sea are concerned. His remark included the seals, dolphins, and whales. There simply are no transitional forms in the fossil record between the marine mammals and their supposed land mammal ancestors. Romer suggests that whales may have descended from a primitive carnivore, although concerning the sirenia, that is the sea cows and the cetacea, which is whales and dolphins, he admits that we are ignorant of their terrestrial forebears and cannot be sure of their place of origin. We don't know which group they are most closely related to and how they descended. It is interesting to note that many of the so-called primitive carnivorous mammals had about 40 teeth differentiated into incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. The porpoises, dolphins, and whales, however, may possess teeth far in excess of that number, one porpoise, as 300, and the teeth of these mammals, marine mammals, are usually simple pegs or wedges and are not differentiated into incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. They all look the same. Worsig has suggested recently, on the other hand, that dolphins may have evolved from land mammals resembling the even-toed ungulates of today, such as cattle, pigs, and buffaloes. So apparently that was one of the original picks. It is quite entertaining, starting with cows, pigs, or buffaloes, to attempt to visualize what the intermediates would have looked like. Starting with a cow, one could even imagine one line of descent which prematurely became extinct due to what might be called an utter failure. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, whenever he gave that uh, talk, he always got a, a good laugh on that last line. Um, The point being that it's hard to visualize how you get a half whale, half cow, or any mixture thereof. Um, the solution has been rather dramatic, and all of a sudden the evolutionists started using this line as the best line they have. And it's partly they're proud of it because of the great difficulty they had before it. This starts with Philip Gingrich and uh, some of his students. And um, in 1994, uh, Stephen Jay Gould wrote the article Hooking Leviathan by its Past and Natural History. And uh, he points out that in intermediate fossil forms are rare. You may remember that he's been saying this for a long time. The trade secret of the paleontologist is that the intermediate forms are extremely rare. And um, that's why he invented punctuated equilibrium is to account for that problem. Um, there are three major groups of aquatic mammals, if you don't count sea otters, and they are pinnipedia, which is seals, sea lions, and walruses, sirenia, dugongs, and manatees, and cetacea, which is whales and dolphins. And if you're looking at uh, pinnipedia, it kind of makes sense that they could have originally banned land animals that have been, been gradually adapted for water. Um, intermediate forms are relatively easy to see how they might have survived. But uh, as Gould says, I admit, of course, that the transition to manatees and whales represents no trivial extension. And we're going to explore that a little bit later. And then he goes on to say, armed with such wisdom of human ages, I am absolutely delighted to report that our usually recalcitrant fossil record, notice it's really tough most of the time, 
has come through in exemplary fashion. The embarrassment of past absence has been replaced by a bounty of new evidence and by the sweetest series of transitional fossils an evolutionist could ever hope to find. Truly, we have met the enemy, and he is now ours. He presents this in several different cases. Case one, he calls Pachycetus. The teeth strongly resemble those of terrestrial mesonychids, as anticipated. Um, by the way, keep in mind that they don't think it's mesonychids anymore. They think it's artiodactyls, which is uh, deer, probably the closest relative being the hippopotamus. Um, but the skull, in feature after feature, clearly belongs to the developing lineage of whales. Now, I wish that he had said which features they were, but uh, his verdict in terms of intermediacy, one could hardly hope for a more for more from the limited material of skull bones only. Pa uh, Pachycetus was a skull, and the rest of it's kind of imagined, I guess. Um, to be fair, we found more material now, so we know a little bit more about Pachycetus. Um, but the uh, Limit remains severe, and the results therefore inconclusive. We know nothing of the limbs, tail, or body form of Pachycetus, and therefore cannot judge its transitional status in these key features of anyone's ordinary conception of a whale. Case two, Basilosaurus. Pachycetus, I believe, is this one right here. Basilosaurus is that one right there. In an exciting discovery, they, that is Gingrich et al., reported the first complete hind limb skeleton found in any whale, a lovely and elegant structure put together from s several partial specimens, including all pelvic bones, all leg bones, that is the femur, tibia, fibula, and even the patella, or kneecap, and nearly all foot and finger bones, right down to the phalanges, the finger bones, of the three preserved digits. And he gives a reference. Uh, the verdict is terrific and exciting, but no cigar and no backpacker for creationists. In other words, this is really kind of a strange whale rather than a true intermediate. The limbs, although complete, are too small to work as true intermediates must, if these particular limbs worked at all, that is, for locomotion on both land and sea. I intend no criticism of Basilosaurus, but merely point out that this creature had already crossed the bridge while well, retaining in a most informative remnant of the other side, we must search for an earlier inhabitant of the bridge itself. And now uh, the Indocetus, which is um, uh, Gingrich and colleagues found pelvic bones in the ends of both femur and tibia, but no foot bones, and insufficient evidence for reconstructing the full limb and its articulations. The leg bones are large and presumably functional on both land and sea. The tibia in particular differs little in size and complexity from that of the related and fully terrestrial Mesonychia uh, Pachyana uh, ossifragia. The authors conclude the pelvis has a large and deep acetabulum, that is the socket for articulation of the femur or thigh bone. The proximal femur is robust, strong, the tibia is long. All these features taken together indicate that Indocetus was probably able to sport its weight on land, and it was almost certainly amphibious, as early uh, is seen Pachycetus is re interpreted to have been. We speculate that Indocetus, like Pachycetus, entered the sea to feed on fish, but returned to the land to rest and to birth and raise its young. Verdict, almost there, but not quite enough. We need more material. All the right features are now in place, primarily leg bones of sufficient size and complexity, but we need a better sense of connection and function. And finally, the piece de resistance, um, case four. Large, complete, and functional hind legs for land and sea, finding the smoking gun. Unfortunately, no pelvic bones have been found, at least when he was writing, 
but most elements of a large, powerful hind leg were uncovered, recovered, including a complete femur, parts of the tibia and fibula, and a astragalus, or ankle bone, and several phalanges. To quote the authors, the feet are enormous, which is interesting. The feet actually get bigger before they get smaller. The fourth metatarsal, for example, is nearly six inches long, and the associated toe almost seven inches in length. Interestingly, the last phalanx of each toe ends in a small hoof, as in the terrestrial Mesonychid ancestors. Keep in mind that that's incorrect. According to the standard line now, it's actually the artiodactyls. Greedy verdict. Greedy paleontologists used to working with fragments in, in reconstructing holes always want more. Some pelvic bones would be nice, for, for starters, but if you had given me both a blank piece of paper and a blank check, I could not have drawn you a theoretical intermediate any better than, or more convincing than Ambulocetus. Those dogmatists who, by verbal trickery, can make white black and black white will never be convinced of anything, but Ambulocetus is the very animal that they proclaim impossible in theory. Um, <clears throat> Now, just to go and look at some of the uh, uh, actual evidence that they're talking about, uh, this is one of Gingrich's um, articles in 1983, Science. Uh, by the way, the whale now has more or less supplanted the horse as the prototype of uh, evolutionary progression. The horse had all kinds of problems, and uh, uh, while you can still make some kind of an evolutionary uh, pattern out of it, it's more of a bush than it is a sequence, and most people are not uh, too impressed with it. And that's why, if you go to the museums nowadays, the horse has been kind of put back in its stable, and the whale has been uh, swum out in its place. Here's. Uh, an example of uh, what they have found, and uh, this is the skull. This is the piece that they found, and this piece right here, and uh, this is the uh, top side, and this is the underside, and this is where, um, th this is the part that they're all excited about, that this uh, inner ear looks more like a whale than it does like a, uh, uh, like land-based mammals, and therefore they're saying this is now starting on the track to becoming a whale. As you can see, there's quite a bit of imagination that has to be put in to, in order to make the uh, uh, creature uh, into a whole picture. Um, this is a, the, a little more detail of the uh, uh, inner ear of uh, Pachycetus and the related skull bones. And you can see that there's an external auditory meatus that comes up to it. This is clearly a land listening animal. Uh, but, uh, and it's interesting, I, I would like to see exactly what the uh, different changes were that gradually move this thing more in the direction of, of being a whale. But that's why they pick on Pachycetus, otherwise it's just a simple land, land animal. Um, Dewis and et al. talks about whale ankles. They've heard of that astragalus bone. Well, here's what it looked like. Uh, and. Uh, this is different views of the pachycetid cetacean. And uh, um, then here's a Mesonychian there with, uh, from the, the planter view would be from below. And this is, so this, these two are directly comparable to each other. Um, and uh, this is supposed to be an ambulocetid cetacean. And 
I guess I'm having a hard time figuring out exactly how this is supposed to be that much alike uh, and different from all other animals, but uh, perhaps somebody later has written something that's more definitive. I haven't seen it. And um, Gingrich et al., the hind limbs of uh, Basilosaurus, and here you can see how they figure it was put. Uh, these are the legs extended, these are the legs flexed, I think. Um, and you can see they're very small legs, and there's no way they're going to support the, uh, the animal, which is a huge animal. Uh, but they do have something that's pretty close to a complete leg. And this is the fused astragalus navicular ectocuniform and mesocuniform bones and Basilosaurus, and you'll notice that, that all of those bones just kind of all run together, and um, so you don't really see a separate, a separate uh, astragalus bone. And then to listen in 1983, the origin of underwater hearing in whales, and uh, it shows you the Incas. Again, I'd love to see something that showed the progression. You just don't find those in the, in the literature. And uh, here's something that's a little bit more of a progression. And this is a, a stragglers from uh, Cetacea, although obviously it's fused to something else. Pachycetus, Artiodactyla, and Primitive Mantle. So they're saying that, it, that this is more similar to that than anything else. Um, uh, more from Thewissen. Here's uh, a whole uh, whole bunch of bones from, uh, and I have forgotten exactly which one of them it is. Um, some of it's uh, evidently jaw, the back of the skull. Um, this is a reconstruction of, our, of, of Ambulocetus while standing and while at the end of a power stroke during swimming. And it, the front legs are really kind of quite small and uh, you get the impression that this creature would have, if, if their reconstruction is correct, would be almost like a, a seal. Um, and Sporadol in 1983 has an uh, article on vestibular evidence for the evolution of aquatic behavior in early cetaceans. And this is kind of an interesting thing. They have, uh, this is bush baby, which has no relationship to any of the other ones whatsoever. Um, this is Ichthyolestis, which is one of those ones that are claimed to be in line to become a dolphin eventually. Um, this one here is uh, in Indocetus. And you can see here that the, uh, that the semicircular canals have gotten quite a bit smaller. And uh, in a dolphin, you can see they're very small. Um, the uh, cochlea is partially unwound in the dolphin, which is kind of an interesting feature. Although, you know, if I'm looking at the cochlea here, I'm not sure that there's that much difference between these cochleas. And, um, and it seems like the dolphin is quite a bit different. Um, I think you have to use your imagination if you want to try to make that cochlea into something progressing to a whale-type cochlea. And um, here's a little bit um, more modern uh, drawing of all of the bones that are there. You can see how there are some of the bones that are missing. Um, in Pachyceta still. And uh, this is a full land mammal, which everybody agrees with. This is uh, Pachyceta, this is Ambulocetus, and this is uh, Basilosaurus. Or, pardon me, this is Dorodon, not Basilosaurus. And then this is finally is the right whale. So you can get an idea of what's happening to the uh, skeleton. Um, 
The question is, well, are whales descended from other mammals? So you kind of would say yes, if you're an evolutionist, they pretty much have to be. And the two questions, and number one is, is there a good mechanism that we can think of that would be, that would allow this to happen? And two, is there any evidence for that mechanism? And uh, there's a related question, which is, which group is actually ancestral to whales? And again, uh, that's apparently changed based on the ankle bone, the astragalus. Um, and it used to be thought it was mesonychids, and even when Stephen Jay Gould wrote it up, he thought it was mesonychids, and in fact, it's now felt to be artiodactyls. That's the uh, uh, sheep, deer, pigs, cows, uh, hippopotamus, with the hippopotamus being actually the closest relative. The standard answer, as I said, to the, is not the mesonychids. It's now thought to be the artiodactyls. Mesonychids are, if I remember correctly, extinct at this point. Um, it does seem to me that the animals, that animals that could be considered intermediate have been found, but still with a gap between land-based animals and whales. And uh, functionally, there's quite a bit of difference. And one of them is you have to bury your young underwater. And um, um, how convincing the series is, I think, depends on how badly you want or don't want to be convinced. You can look at it in several different ways. The series is still, I think, a relatively successful prediction of evolutionary theory. It's not perfect, but uh, it's certainly they have more than they used to. Um, but it, the, the, the series doesn't answer the question, how do you do that? It only answers, is there evidence for this kind of a transition? And I think you'd have to say, yes, depending on how you look at it, that's probably true. The question of how could this happen is still being answered on the topological level, which means how things are shaped. You know, things that gradually get larger, or smaller, or more pointed, or, or curved, or something like that. <coughs> Rather than saying you need to change these bases and these bases and these bases in the DNA or perhaps in the epigenetic level or something so in order to get a whale. Evidence for the sequential existence of intermediate forms is really insignificant if the mechanistic re resources are inadequate. In other words, finding a full line going from one to the other, if in order to get from one, one class to the other you have to do a total rewrite of DNA, you haven't really solved the problem. Because what you need is not just that this kind of transition happened, but in order to satisfy the standard evolutionary theory, you need to be able to say that it could reasonably have happened without any intelligent intervention. Evidence for short age, of course, such as carbon-14 in these creatures, or creatures even older, would destroy the value of the series. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's not that old, it couldn't have evolved. And I ended the last time I talked about this with a comment that the, a suggestion for further research from a creationist viewpoint is that we should start looking for whales earlier on, before the Eocene. And of course, that would completely remove the evidentiary value of this series because if you have whales that were before that time period, then uh, these creatures couldn't have been their ancestors they could only have been their nieces or nephews rather than their uh, great-grandfathers and mothers. Uh, there is a new article by Rick Durrett and Dina Schmidt, and I came across this from uh, First Evolution News and Views referring to a video that uh, Richard Sternberg, that's the guy of, uh, uh, who published uh, Stephen Meyer's article and got Ken from, uh, got 
pushed out, it's probably a better way of putting it, from the Smithsonian. And, um, and he points out this article. This article is a, an attempted partial refutation of uh, Michael Behe's book, The Edge of Evolution. And it's found um, at a website that I've given. Um, and it talks about getting two mutations in a large mammal, and it follows its own calculations, which are different from Michael B. He's in that it has the square root of one uh, probability times the other, rather than two probabilities multiplied together. And, uh, hmm, okay. It says, we now show that two coordinated changes that turn off one regulatory sequence and turn on another without either mutant becoming fixed are unlikely to occur in the human population. And this is the uh, final reason for that. And that is to say that if you follow their calculations, you have 8.66 times 10 to the sixth generations in order to get one mutation or two mutations that are coordinated with each other uh, between a human and let's say a chimp. And if you multiply by 25 years per generation, it gives you 216 million years. Well, even if you multiply it by 10 generations, you still have almost 100 million years. Now, you think about that, what that is saying is that if you are lucky, you might get one of those within five million years. To get two of those within five million years is just unreasonable. And yet the divergence between humans and chimps and gorillas is all supposed to have taken place within about five million years. Are there that few changes between the DNA of humans and chimps? That's just stunning. But of course, he applies it to whales. You have the same problem with whales, that um, you start out with um, um, you start out with Pachycetus at 50,000 years, and then you get to Basilosaurus at um, uh, 40,000, something like that. Um, you are now looking at 10 million years is all the time you've got. Ambulocetus is just about in the middle of that. Um, that's just not enough time. <laughs> because you have to realize what kinds of changes you're looking at. Well, first, the whale has to have ball joints, that is, so that the tail goes up and down instead of going sideways. Then you have to put the testes inside of the body so they won't get slammed against stuff when the whale is swimming. But at the same time, you have to keep them cool. So what the whale does is it takes blood that's pumped out to the flukes and gets cooled by the water. And then it takes that blood and it runs it around the testes. And that keeps the testes cooler than the body temperature. Uh, the reason that's important is because the testes are kept at body temperature, they don't produce sperm. Which means that the whale leaves no descendants. So as soon as you get the, the testes inside the body, you have to have this current. Does that take only two mutations? Well, that's uh, that's a big if. I doubt that it's that simple. But even if it did, the chances of that happening uh, for whales are, you know, probably l well less than one in ten. You know, at a certain point, you're starting to beg the question as to why it happened that fast. In addition, the babies have to be born tail first so that there is more time for them to get their first breath. Because 
they can't breathe underwater. So they have to go straight up uh, into the air and they're all born tail first for that reason. Um, and the babies have to learn to hold their breath until they get to the air, of course. It's a whole lot different from if you're having your babies on land where they can just breathe the air that's around them. Um, the mammary glands have to be modified for underwater use. The blowhole, the nose, has to be moved back to the top of the head so that the whale can breathe easily. Um, the kidneys have to be modified so that they can handle salt water all the time. Our kidneys are made so that they concentrate sodium. Their kidneys are made so they can pump sodium out because seawater is about uh, um, uh, three or four times the concentration of what uh, our normal uh, body chemistry is. So we, they have to get rid of a lot of seawater. So you have to modify the kidneys to do that. All of these things presumably happened at the same time, even if they didn't happen exactly at the same time. They have to happen within five million years because by the time you get to uh, the 10 million years, because by the time you get to Basilosaurus, you're already a uh, fully blown whale. Um, so you see from the time of Pachycetus, really pretty much from the time of Ambulocetus, uh, you have to go to all of those things changing and becoming whales. And uh, you know, by the time you're into Basilosaurus, you're definitely into whales, and that's about 45 million years. Um, but there's another article that makes that a little e tighter even, and that's found in the Revista Peruana de Biologia, I think. Um, and interestingly enough, the Abstract is in both English and Spanish, and the article itself is in English, at least on the internet. Um, and uh, they date a jawbone of a fully whale like creature at 49.5 million years. Now, and there's the reference in case you want to look for it. And here's a picture of the jawbone, and it has a tooth, and they, they've looked at it, and they've figured that uh, the only thing that really fits this particular critter is a whale. And if you follow their timeline, it's basically only about five million years behind Pachycetus and only about uh, two million years behind Amulocetus. Doesn't leave you enough time to evolve all this stuff. It's just getting tighter and tighter. In other words, a creature that's fairly similar to Basilosaurus is now up at not quite 50 million years ago by the standard uh, chronology. And uh, this is interestingly an artist's conception of what the whale would have looked like. Now. They got that whole thing from one jaw. They have no clue as to whether the neck is flexible like it's drawn here or whether it's more straight as it's drawn with the creature before this. Um, uh, obviously, somebody has gone uh, somewhat overboard on it. Uh, you can see that it, it's drawn with hind legs. They don't know whether it has hind legs or not. but. Uh, that's the, um, that's the state of art, and of course, we've seen this kind of thing happen with a, a few remnants of jawbone or, or skull, and all of a sudden you have a complete creature, uh, including watching it crouched with uh, whether it has hair or not, and what kind and where, uh, in the human ape controversy. Um, but that's the... Um, that's the creature that, that they've drawn from that. But you can see what that does is it basically puts it at just about the same time as Ambulocetus, uh, maybe a million years, two million years beyond. And the whole bridge from being able to have your babies on land to have, having your babies in the water and never getting out of the water and never cooling your testes down, 
Um, that's been done. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, leave the uh, floor open for comments and questions. Yes. Nobody wants to say anything? <laughs> um, well, I'll just, you know, this has been such a, an interesting story and uh, uh, such a good presentation here of this. Uh, I, I can't help but um, comment on uh, one the uh, this has been used in as such a good strong case for evolution that, that you uh, and uh, it's done by just mainly two individuals uh, Tweeson and uh, Gingrich and Tweeson happens to be Gingrich's uh, graduate student uh, comes from the University of Michigan. Uh, happens to be my alma mater, and I apologize for it. Uh, the uh, story uh, that seems to be coming out of this that I think is more, most significant is this, this uh, rate of change, uh, evolutionary change, that uh, uh, we need to get that, that the quantities on this thing. This is, uh, uh, these, these children go to these museums and say they have no idea about rates of change and uh, how you can get uh, uh, exact mutations, uh, how rare this is, and uh, got ser put several of them together, you know, it just does not work out. Uh, and it's totally ignored, and these charts are put up and so on, and uh, looks impressive at first, uh, but man, you get into the details of it, it just does not work. Does not work. No. And that's the reason for people like James Shapiro, who's, who has a new evolution for the 21st century, which uh, is that the cell actually designs its own evolution, that, that, there is, that evolution is not random. Uh, that's the reason mm -hmm. that you have people like Stuart Kaufman trying to argue for uh, self-organization. Well, if you're going to say that, you might as well postulate miracles. It, uh, it's, I mean, it's the same thing, essentially. Uh, that's the reason for the Altenberg 16. Could, I mean, could, the, uh, the more you look at it, the more it's obvious that to the people out there that, that there just isn't enough mm -hmm. probabilistic resources to get there if you rely simply on random mutations and natural selection. Uh, the interesting th thing I think about Shapiro is that uh, uh, his postulate, you know, he, he has self or uh, he has self-directed mutation, and he's got some in, uh, some evidence for that. For example, uh, the immune system actually does that in humans. Um, he's got other organisms that deliberately mutate themselves. Uh, more uh, in a uh, in a uh, hostile environment, presumably with the idea that some of the mutations might make it through. Uh, but there's a great resistance to doing that, and the resistance is that it sounds too much like creation. And I think mm -hmm. that. What you actually see then <coughs> is very similar to the objections that were made to uh, uh, J. Harlan Bretz when he proposed his flood. It just sounded too much like a biblical deluge. And you know, the first question is, well, where did all the water come from? And the fact that there are gravel beds and they have ripple marks mm -hmm. on them and there's ripple, giant ripple marks in various places. The fact that these are obviously carved canyons and they have to be carved in certain ways. The fact that you have erratic boulders. All kinds of evidence that was there that just didn't come from other processes uh, was totally ignored until they could find a mechanism. 
Um, it's almost as if you could say the business <coughs> of science today, um, as opposed to a search for truth, is to make the world safe for atheism. Well, uh, yeah, that's the basic question. I would, uh, we, were in dis we could discuss later. Uh, <coughs> I would raise one question that uh, I think was evident in your diagrams and uh, perhaps Basilosaurus is uh, uh, an outstanding example. That's those legs. Uh, and I, I have commented on this before here, and I'll repeat it right now uh, for those of you who may not have been there been or remember what I said. Uh, we do find legs on whales, rarely. Uh, hind legs. Hind legs, yes. Yeah, not, not Four legs are on all whales. Not the front flippers, but yeah. the hind legs. Uh, there's been one case, I think, of a, uh, oh, I think, boy, it went one of these large whales, anyway, uh, found the northwest where they found about a three-foot leg in the hind part there. Uh, there is a uh, example of a snake with a leg on it uh, that had you know, toes and webs, actually, between the, the toes. Uh, rare case, you know, occasionally a snake will do this thing. Uh, a whale will occasionally do this. On uh, dolphins, you have ma several cases of uh, bumps where the legs are supposed to be. Uh, these are anomalous bunk bumps, and you, you do find in their tissue that well, muscular tissue, bone tissue, and so on, that kind of suggests they may have been where the wheels, where the legs are supposed to be, uh, these are anomalous bumps. Uh, actually, not so anomalous. I mean, they're symmetrical there on in the rear part of the body, right where you'd expect the legs. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that uh, this gets into uh, suggesting that there's a basic vertebrate anatomy in all vertebrate organisms and that in order to produce different kinds of organisms, certain genes are turned off. And when that turning off process goes awry, then you get the basic pattern. Uh, that's the best explanation I can give you for this, but you have to recognize that this is a question that, that people, and uh, these little bones you have on the, on the whale associated with the reproductive organs, uh, probably come from that or maybe modified from that, but so on. People wonder, hey, no, well, these wheels have bad legs. They must have evolved from some quadruped uh, type of thing. And we need to recognize this. Th there is that pattern there, but there is an explanation for it, although be it that we don't have good evidence that uh, this was the way God did it, uh, it does explain to a certain extent. This evidence that, that is shown often in, in museums and so on where you have whales, they like to show these these hind legs. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, is, is this one of the big problems of evolution or how about the Cambrian, Cambrian explosion? Uh, how many animals there do, do not, uh, lack ancestors as well? And the other thing I wanted to say is, is evidence for common ancestry, does that overrule common design? Well, to take your second question first, no. Um, but the best example I can give you is something called Barra's Blunder. And he shows that if you take a 1957 Corvette and then you take several years behind it, you can see how things have gradually been modified to, to uh, 
be more streamlined or to incorporate new uh, types of, uh, uh, let's say, wheels or something like that. Um, uh, and um, he says this is a really good I illustration of how evolution works. Well, of course, the problem is that, that uh, Corvettes didn't evolve. Uh, you could say that you, the plans evolved in the mind of the, of the designers, but Corvettes themselves are very clearly designed. Um, and so I think you could say that a designer could very easily wind up doing it that, that way. Uh, all of this kinds of uh, uh, design they have, uh, and I'll just call it design because it 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 sure looks designed. The, you know the idea of having blood from the tail flukes flow by the uh, testes to cool them down so that they can produce sperm. That's a design feature. Uh, everywhere else. The only reason for believing that it wasn't really designed at all, it just kind of happened that way, and once it happened that way, why well, the whales could take advantage of a neat uh, feature, uh, is because you don't want there to be any kind of designer at all. That's the only reason for doing that. And can we say that uh, that theory of evolution was the product of design of somebody who is very intelligent and guiding these experts into trying to negate the fact that we have an almighty designer. Because what's the purpose of the devil? He wants to, how do you say, do everything possible to deny the creator the honor and glory he deserves. I think that there is a meta narrative behind all of our human narratives that goes that way that tells us that there is, in fact, a, uh, uh, there's someone who's trying to confuse the facts and will use any reasonably plausible argument to do so. And is basically as trustworthy as a used car salesman who's trying to dump something on you, in all fairness, less trustworthy. Um, here's, a lot of people don't realize this, but this whole argument is really a theological one. It goes, it starts out by saying, you can't trust the Bible with the time frame. So we'll go out and find our new time frame, and it'll probably be longer. And sure enough, we found this evidence that if you ignore the Bible, well, that, you know, could be there, could be thousands, could be millions, could be hundreds of millions of years. Um, that's the process that was taking place in the minds of uh, some precursors to begin with and then um, later on to James Hutton and uh, Charles Lael. And really that forms the background to what you're looking at. The next step is to go, uh, well, all of these creatures, did God create them just the way they are? Or did he, or was there a gradual change from one creature to another and they have a grandfather, grandson relationship to where creatures went from one to the other and then back? And if you answer that in the affirmative, then you look at what you have and you realize that what, what is buried is, is not a perfect creation. Then it's easier to get God out of the picture. It's essentially a theological argument. It's, if you like, a, a Darwin was uh, engaging in theodicy. He was trying to get God out of the picture. Um, because then if you see terrible things in nature, you don't worry about it because that's just nature doing its thing. It's not God. 
And in fact, that's one of the arguments that they'll immediately come down. If you start making an argument that's really making sense and really putting them on the spot, first thing they say, well, what about your God? You know, how could he kill all those people in uh, Thailand? And you're going, what does that have to do with anything? But that's really the argument. These people don't want God in charge of nature because nature obviously has evil. And the truth of the matter is that people like William Paley are susceptible to that. Now, traditional conservative Christians, including Adventists, are not susceptible to that, really, because we're perfectly comfortable in saying an enemy had done this, that Tyrannosaurus may have been a, a much different creature before people got a hold of it. And Adventists in particular, who talk about the amalgamation of man and beast, uh, meaning that uh, you know various beasts uh, getting their genes mixed up, probably by intelligent design, if you like, are perfectly willing to say maybe Tyrannosaurus wasn't one of the original kinds, or perhaps Tyrannosaurus was a development from one of the original kinds. So we don't have that kind of a problem. Thanks to Ellen G. White, the well, great that's, controversy. That's true. That's true. Just a comment about your uh, question about the Cambrian explosion. Keep in mind the Cambrian explosion is a double problem. For not only you don't have the intermediates, but you have to produce a whole variety of basic types, you know, like s sponges and clams and uh, starfishes and so on, uh, within a short period of time, uh, a very short period of time. So it's, uh, the intermediates aren't there and you have to have very rapid evolution. And they've been looking for intermediates and all kinds of uh, possibilities and so on for suggesting intermediates there and so on and it's a clear problem severe problem for evolution so uh, you've got the same problem with the whales to a certain extent you, you have a very short time for their evolution you got to have all kinds of changes and it's getting shorter uh, yes <laughs> and uh, I, I would ask uh, is there any reaction to this uh, fossil in Antarctica uh, I mean, uh, immediately they say, oh, well, then, uh, that's just, you know, it's just one, it's not valid by, it. Just, I'm just wondering what, what Gingrich and Thwaiton are saying about it. That's an interesting question. I suspect that there is a, quite a silence over it because the more you talk about it, the worse it gets. It's getting the Gosnell treatment. <laughs> what? what? Oh, the, 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 the whale that they found that's supposed to be 49.5 million years old that I, was, that we mentioned at the very end. And it's only a jaw, so you can't really say much. But uh, okay. this uh, one over here that... Uh, Thank you for your presentation. Uh, this is my first time uh, attending this class, and I'm visiting from uh, Northern California. Um, but as a mechanical engineer by, by training, uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, some of your earlier comments about uh, some of the progression in design of the, the Corvette that you mentioned. Um, but also, as I've looked at this question of faith and science and evolution versus creation, um, what I'm finding is that many of our colleagues on the other side of the argument um, really are working from an, a position of incomplete knowledge. And so they are they're making many leaps to conclusions uh, to explain away some of those gaps uh, in their knowledge. Uh, one thing in particular that I have uh, been a part of some of my conversations with friends um, is I find that 
in the evolutionary biology thought process, um, the whole question of entropy that uh, mechanical engineers uh, work with is sort of missing in their consideration and um, there is very little accounting for uh, thermodynamics uh, in this attempt to describe their evolutionary path. And I wonder um, whether you can comment on how the understanding of entropy plays into some of these conversations. Well, it, it, it doesn't play. Basically, um, it gets a modified uh, version of ignoring it. Um, anybody who suggests that the second law of thermodynamics has anything to do with this is vigorously attacked. Um, and while a blunt application of it probably isn't fair, uh, there's a more sophisticated application that says that information in general tends to degenerate with time and that in order to get it to increase you have to have something with intelligence that can put it in. Um, and that argument is most clearly developed by uh, John Sanford in his book Genetic Entropy. We've talked about that before in class and uh, I think Sanford is essentially right. In fact, one of the questions that I think is probably fair to ask is how have whales stayed more or less the same for 40 million years? Why, why have they managed to escape genetic entropy? And I think the reason why is most likely because it hasn't been 40 million years. For the same reason, by the way, that I think that we still have um, uh, proteinaceous material in dinosaur bones. It just hasn't been that long. Uh, people measure how fast these things deteriorate and they're le staying around longer than they should. And the obvious answer is uh, the people who argue that it's there are right because you can demonstrate it. The people who argue it shouldn't be there be and must not be there because uh, because it can't last that long, are correct in their premise. Uh, they're both right, and the simple way to figure it out is that there hasn't been that much time, and then both sides are correct. Uh, and more importantly, both sides' evidence is correct. And I think that's the key. Uh, and one of the things we're trying to do in the Sabbath School is bring out points that would otherwise get the Gosnell treatment where the mainstream media and the science texts are totally silent about it. Uh, you won't read this. Well, actually, you will read this in bits and pieces, but they'll never make the connection that this really s tightens up the time frame for evolution of whales. Um, in fact, the announcement made in MSNBC once and then disappeared. But nobody's put it together with the problem of this, this nice, neat little progression that they have and how it throws a monkey wrench into it. Yes, yeah, so I think really it is a question of these people. Um, Thank uh, you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Refusing to acknowledge the existence of God uh, more than anything else. And, and I really think uh, their knowledge is, is inadequate. And, so I've concluded that uh, Christians, particularly Seventh Avenue Christians, uh, really have nothing to apologize for. Um, Not only that, I think we have lots of evidence to speak for. Right. And it's, in my view, a tragedy that we don't do more of it, and that's one of the things that the Sabbath School is trying to correct. Right. Last comment I'll make is um, I came across a, a video that um, had, that featured a discussion of the uh, three renowned uh, atheists who had written some books that got a lot of play uh, maybe about two or so years ago in the media. Sam Harris, I think, is one. Uh, this Dennett fellow. And then, of course, uh, uh, Chris Hitchens, who's, uh, who, who's passed. But 
I, I spent two hours listening to their conversation. And again, it occurred to me that these people really don't know what they're talking about. I mean, the, the level of ignorance that, oh, the other person is the guy from, um, from England. Uh, Dawkins. Dawkins. What they've based many of their views about Christianity and creation uh, in their atheism on is popular misunderstanding of Christianity. Um, the, the breadth of ignorance about the Bible uh, is astounding. And so how anybody can take these people seriously uh, is beyond me. And I think at the end of you know, listening, to, uh, watching this, um, I think I had more a sense of um, sympathy for these people than regarding them as any authority uh, on the area of knowledge. Because what we are talking about um, is a knowledge space. You've got the spiritual knowledge space, and you've got the natural knowledge space. These two, in my view, are not really separate. People tend to separate them, but I think uh, they, they're very, very related. So um, I appreciate you know being here for this first time, and, and hopefully when I'm visiting uh, Loma Linda again, I can grab the class at the beginning. <laughs> well, you're very welcome. We appreciate your being here. Um, did you want to say something? Here. Faster. <coughs> Just this, this comment about, uh, from a basic approach that you've been referring to, uh, one can, I think, make the argument that uh, the Bible and uh, religion and our search for truth within that context is a broader and more open approach the Bible takes in nature, heavens declare the glory of God, and so on. God is the creator of nature, and so on. Uh, it's a much broader approach than the, I might say, the scientific, the current scientific approach, which is a system that effectively excludes God. Uh, and uh, limits itself to materialistic and naturalistic e explanations, uh, and uh, which are impressive but very simplistic, and uh, certainly don't answer our deep questions about our morality or our consciousness, and so on, and uh, uh, so that uh, I think we can be feel a little more secure, that you're more likely to find truth if you have a broader spectrum than if you have a narrow spectrum. I think that's true. Anyway, next week, um, uh, um, Leonard Brand will be here and t talk about his book and Richard Davidson's book, Choose You This Day. I encourage you all to be here. and. If possible, read it and uh, bring questions, and and I think he'll be. Int I think it'll be an interesting time. Yeah, can I add uh, something I heard last night? Dwight Nelson was interviewing Yvette Williams. She used to be the pastor of Campus Hill Church, and she was telling her story, how she got converted. She was a politician. She was, I think, a mayor of the city, and uh, she was. Uh, Definitely 80, an atheist. She didn't believe in the Bible. She didn't believe in Christianity, nothing of that sort. And then she says one day she was, uh, how do you say, arguing with somebody else. And she was coming very, very strong in order to convince the other person of how wrong that person was. And somebody said, a soft answer turns off wrath. And she says, where did you get this? And he said, from the Bible. Here's a copy. You can have it. She started reading the Bible and she was impressed, but of course she did not uh, be 
become a Christian immediately. But she says that one day she heard a voice. She was with other people. She heard a voice from above. She looked up and she responded to that voice. And they said, boy, we need to, uh, how do you say, get this lady into where she probably belongs. <laughs> they thought she was losing her mind. And then another day she was, uh, I think, asleep, uh, dreaming. She saw several kinds of ice cream. And she uh, noticed there was pistachio, her favorite. And she says, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I want to be able to taste that ice cream. <laughs> and she heard the same voice from above saying, if you follow me, you will live. I mean, there are different ways of people living atheism, but God uses the best, the most appropriate method for each person, each individual. 